Hey Joey, how is your pizza business doing? The business is great. I'm accepting online orders soon. And I'm purchasing six servers for it. That's great news, but may I ask why six servers? I've estimated about 200 orders in a day. And for every 50 orders, we need one server. Then, why are you getting six servers? On a normal day, four servers are enough. But on the grand opening day, I expect 300 orders. And what are you doing with the extra servers after the grand opening? I don't know. I guess I'm stuck with them. The vendor doesn't accept me to return the servers. I think I will leave them as a spurs. And who knows, maybe in a year, I get more orders and I will need the two additional servers. Have you considered cloud? What? Cloud computing services like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, or Azure. I've heard of them, but I don't know much about these cloud services. You think I can use them for building my online ordering service? Yes, you can get the compute power you need for running Joy Pizza Online Store from one of these cloud service providers. Oh, I see. So they are selling servers. Well, kind of. These cloud service providers allow you to access IT resources like servers or data storage over the internet. What's different about them? Are they cheaper? If I can lower our cost, I will make Russ super happy. He has partnered with me in Joy Pizza and every day he checks the expenses. Of course, managing costs is as important as bringing more revenue in. Cloud computing services are more cost effective because of a significant differentiator and that's their pricing model, which is pay as you go. It means that I can get the extra servers only if I need them. Not only that, but you can also stop paying for them as soon as you don't need the extra capacity anymore. With cloud computing, you can spin up a new server in minutes and you get charged only for the period you use it. That will be a huge saving. It saves us a few thousand dollars we needed to pay in advance. That's right. With cloud computing services, you have more freedom and you pay only for what you need and what you use. That's the benefit of the pay-as-you-go model. Cool. You said it only takes minutes to spin up a new server? Yes. Through a management console, you request the resources you want. It can be a new server you want to spin up or some disk storage and you get access to them in minutes. When you buy your own servers, you need to pay for them upfront. Wait for the equipment to get prepared by the vendor, ship to your data center, get racked, installed, and configured, and only then you can use them. That's right, this cloud thing sounds great, but where are my servers? I want to see them. You said I access my servers over the internet, but I'm not sure how that can work. Am I even paying for actual servers? I understand that it is slightly different from what you used to do, but think about it this way. Would you or your IT team go to the data center to work with your servers? I believe you don't. You would access your servers remotely. You do the same thing with your servers on the cloud. And yes, the virtual servers you access run on physical servers hosted in massive data centers that are maintained by Cloud providers like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Chandler, you said we get charged only for the period we use those servers on the cloud. Then I guess we can first try them, and if we like it, we'll go with one of the cloud service providers. Exactly, that's another benefit of the cloud. You don't need to have a long-term commitment. Play with the services and see if they're a fit for what you want to build. In this case, if you go with Amazon Web Services, you can start with running an EC2 instance. EC2. Yes, it stands for Elastic Cloud Computing. It simply is what virtual servers are called in AWS. I see. So if I want four servers to start, I get four EC2 instances. Exactly. And remember, these are virtual servers running on top of physical servers. If it is that easy, can you show me how to run an EC2 instance? Sure. First, you create your account on AWS and log into the AWS console. From the list of services under the compute category, click on EC2. 
What are all these other services? Is this a list of different server models? No, there are different services like various storage services on the cloud or several types of databases. Oh, that's a long list and confusing. Well, you don't need to know about all of them. Check this list only when you need something that you think is a common service. If part of your solution is not unique to you, you will likely find it on this list. That's AWS and other cloud computing service providers goal. Providing services for the undifferentiated, heavy lifting IT tasks that are routine, often repetitive and time consuming. Okay, let's continue with running my server. Sure, click on EC2, select one of the configurations. For now, let's go with the first option and click on review and launch. This server has one virtual CPU, one gigabyte of memory and eight gigabytes of storage. Now click on launch and that's it. You have created the virtual server in the cloud and you can access it. That was cool, but what if I need more storage or memory? Can I change them? Of course, not only can you change the settings at the time of configuring your virtual machine, but also you can make many of those changes after. And that's what E stands for, elastic. Elasticity is one of the core benefits of many AWS services. I like it. This service is super fast compared to the traditional way of purchasing and setting up my servers. What about the price per server? Cloud services are usually cheaper, and that's because of the scale. AWS buys thousands and thousands of the underlying equipment, and therefore you benefit from the economies of scale. This conversation made me hungry. Let's order a Joy Special. Okay, let's review what Joey learned about cloud. The most important thing Joey should now have learned is the concept of cloud computing. Cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. Let's double check our understanding of the highlighted items. Cloud computing is on-demand, meaning you get the services as you need them. It is in contrast with upfront and all at once procurement. For example, today you need only one gigabyte of disk space. Well, you get what you need. And if next month you need one terabyte disk space, you can have it. More importantly, if later you want to go back to one gigabyte, you can. That's on demand. IT resources include a range of services from computing power, like servers, databases, storage space, and more. Cloud computing services are doing the heavy lifting of IT tasks that are common and undifferentiated. For example, many businesses need a database as part of their solution, and creating and managing one is not what makes their business unique. It is the design of a database and the data inside it that differentiates businesses. Cloud computing takes care of that repeated task of setting up and managing a database. Over the internet shows the difference between on-premise or at data center IT resources and cloud computing resources. In cloud computing, you do not have access to physical resources. You cannot go to an AWS data center and visit your server, but you have control over them and manage and configure them over the internet. And finally, pay as you go, which should now be clear from Joey, Ross, and Chandler's conversation. You do not have to pay any upfront fees, and you only pay for what you use. Okay, now that we reviewed what cloud computing means, let's go through six main benefits we can enumerate for AWS. You have no upfront expense. Instead, you pay a variable cost. You pay for what you need and what you use. Your business doesn't incur data center cost. In the traditional approach, it costs to either rent a rack or run a data center. You don't need to worry about things like that with AWS. No guessing capacity. We are almost always wrong about our estimations. Purchasing IT resources based on estimated capacity can hurt 
either if the actual need is more or is less. You benefit from massive economies of scale. AWS purchases the required resources at a massive scale. They cost less and AWS passes that saving to you. You can make the most of the increased speed and agility that comes with AWS. It is much faster to provision an IT resource over the cloud than on-premise or at a data center. And finally, you can go global in minutes. All the other five benefits should make sense to you from Joey and Chandler's conversation. But we didn't talk about this benefit. AWS has a presence all around the globe. It makes it super easy for you to provision resources in geographical areas closer to your end user. Okay, so AWS calls servers EC2 instances. That's right, EC2 instances are simply virtual servers that you can configure and run in minutes. They are a type of compute as a service. I see, and you said I can change the configuration of an EC2 instance after I run them. Exactly, flexibility is one of the main benefits of EC2 instances. You can add additional storage to your EC2 after it is started. You can even increase the size of its memory or add a CPU to it. This is also called vertical scaling, meaning you can make instances bigger or smaller as you need. Interesting, so I can increase the computing power of an EC2 instance or I can add more EC2 instances. True, when you increase the resources of an EC2, it is called vertical scaling or scaling up. But it is not always the best solution for handling more load. Sometimes it makes sense to add additional servers instead of adding more resources to your existing EC2. And that's called horizontal scaling or scaling out. I see, so I can scale up or out, make a server stronger or add more servers. Wait a second Chandler, I understand how you can add new servers, but it is hard for me to understand how you can add memory or CPU to a server in minutes. Does AWS have a huge number of employees that quickly install the additional resources we request? No, it's not working like that. EC2 servers are virtual machines. What do you mean they are virtual? They are not real servers? The underlying physical servers, also known as hosts, are super powerful and the resources can be shared. So an application called hypervisors run on them and allows multiple virtual machines to use and share the resources of the same physical hardware. This is called virtualization. You mean our EC2 may run along with some other servers on the same machine? That's correct. The possibility of my server running along with other servers on the same host makes me a bit concerned about its security. I understand your concern, Joy, but your concern is at rest. In virtualization, which is also called multi-tenancy, virtual machines share resources of the physical server, but they are completely independent, isolated, and secured from each other. As a user, you do not need to worry about this at all. Although, if for some regulatory reasons you are mandated to have a dedicated host, you can make it happen in AWS. It will just be more expensive, of course. Makes sense. Speaking of security, I also want to have control over the networking of my EC2 instances. I may want to add specific networking rules. I know that my IT team secured our local network and I'm sure they want to have a strong security for these EC2 instances. You can definitely do that. In AWS, you have full control over your network security. For example, you can block a specific port or protocol or some type of inbound or outbound traffic. Guys, I want to be clear about the number of EC2 instances that we need to spin up and do some cost analysis. Chandler, you said that after the grand opening day, if we do not need the extra servers, we can stop paying for them. And later, when we need, we can have them back. That's right, EC2 instances have a status. When they're working, their status is running. You can either stop the extra servers or terminate them. 
What's the difference? If you stop an EC2 instance, the EBS volume, which is the data storage attached to your server, continues to exist and maintains the data. But if you terminate it, the EBS will get deleted as well. The important thing is that in either case, you do not pay for the EC2 instance anymore. What did Joey learn in this episode? First, he understood that EC2 instances can scale up or out. Scaling up or vertically means increasing the resources of an EC2 instance. Scaling out or horizontally is increasing your compute capacity by adding more servers to your fleet. Joey also learned about virtualization or multi-tenancy. AWS physical hosts run an application called Hypervisor that allows a number of virtual machines to run on them and share the resources of that physical host while they're securely isolated from each other. And finally, Ross has a peace of mind that their account doesn't get charged for stopped or terminated EC2 instances. Chandler, can you show me one of these EC2 instances you're talking about? Sure, let's launch one together. First, you need to create an account with AWS. Then you log in to the AWS Management Console. Once you're logged in, click Services, and from the list, choose EC2. Here you see a box that says Launch Instances. Click on the button, and you see this list of AMIs. When you launch an EC2, you first select a software that suits your needs, and then the hardware. AMI, which stands for Amazon Machine Image, identifies the software. You can pick one of the flavors of Linux, Microsoft, or even macOS. For now, let's go with the first choice, which is Linux. Now, on this second screen, you choose the configuration of your hardware or virtual server. Click on all instance families and you see a complete list of them. Hey Chandler, you didn't show me this list when you launched the server. I know Joey, I didn't want to confuse you. Each of these codes represent a family of configurations and each is good for a specific application. What should I use for Joy Pizza? I don't want to deal with all of this. I know this is too much. You probably only need to look at this page on AWS website. It has grouped these families into five categories. First, general purpose, which provides a balance of compute, memory, and networking resources. It is a good choice for application servers, gaming servers, backend servers, and the small and medium databases. The next category is compute optimized. And as you can say from its name, it's a good choice for applications that demand high performance processors. You may consider them for compute intensive application servers or high performance web servers. They're also good for batch processing. Okay, got it. I will go with an instance type from the general purpose category for now. And if I find I need higher performance, I can go with one from the compute optimized category. Makes sense, Joey, but let me share with you the other three categories as well. It is always good to know what else is at your disposal. Okay, what are the other three? Memory optimized, accelerated computing, and storage optimized. I can guess what they are good for. I expect so, the names are self-explanatory. Memory optimized instances are the best choice for workloads that require a large amount of data to be loaded and processed in memory. You know, memory is different from disk storage. Memory is the storage that is fast and very accessible by the central processing unit. If your application requires a large amount of data in memory before it can run, you should go with the memory optimized type. Accelerated computing category uses hardware accelerators to help with faster calculations. Not all applications need that, but some applications that deal with floating point number calculations, such as weather forecast or graphic processing, or data pattern matching have a lot of floating point calculations, and this is the best choice for them. And finally, storage optimized instances are good choices for a speedy read and write of large data on local storage. Online transaction processing or OLTP systems 
Data warehousing applications and distributed file systems are good examples of when you should use storage optimized instances. They have a very high IOPS. Input output per second. Exactly, they can handle a large number of read and write requests to a storage disks. Well, Chandler, could we now continue with creating that EC2 instance? Sure, we are not far from it. I will still choose the T2 micro for now, which is from the general purpose category. Click on review and launch. We reviewed everything and all looked good. And launch. When you launch an EC2, it gives you a key pair, which is your access key to the server. I'm giving it a name and downloading it. And my instance is running. I can click on view instances and check its status. It may take a few minutes for the instance to initialize. Once it is ready, I click on connect and under the SSH client tab, it has given me step-by-step -step instructions about how to connect to my EC2 instance. Picking the EC2 instance type is choosing the hardware configuration. A massive number of options are available, but a good starting point is selecting the appropriate family. The five instant type families are general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, accelerated computing, and storage optimized. So you said AWS EC2 instances are more economical compared to traditional servers hosted in data centers. Can you give Joy and I an idea of how much it costs us to run four servers? Well, six servers, you know what I mean. Do explain that on the grand opening day, we will need six and maybe after a week, we scale back to four. I can definitely give you an idea of how much it costs for you to run four or six EC2 instances. But first, let me tell you about your options. Okay, I like having options. What are our choices? You have five options. On demand, saving plans, reserved, spot, and dedicated. Which one is the best for us? I think a combination of them. I think you should start with on demand. With on demand, you pay only for the period of the time you run the servers. It is the best choice for short term, irregular workload and does not require any commitment or upfront fees. You start and stop your server whenever you want. You get charged per hour or per second depending on the instance type you choose. That sounds good. I like the flexibility of on-demand. Especially before our grand opening, I don't need to run the servers over the weekends. None of the developers work on them. Exactly, you can start with an on-demand EC2 instance and minimize your costs because you can stop it when you don't need it. And if it turns out you are not opening your online order website, you have not committed to anything. Oh, we will for sure want to go online. Joy Pizza goes online. Okay, well, after you have finished development and when you know you are ready to commit, then you have options for saving some money on your EC2 instances. Well, what are those options? You can go with the AWS saving plan, which gives you up to 72% saving when you commit to a certain consistent amount of compute usage for one year or three years. Or you can go with the reserved instance, which means you commit to use the instance for the period of the term you agreed. Nice, then I think I will start with on-demand instances, but on the launch day, I will switch to four reserved instances. You remember you wanted two of the instances only for one week? All right, I'll keep those two on-demand so I can stop them after a week. Here you go, that sounds right to me. There are two other options that, although may not be right choices for Joy Pizza, but are worth knowing. Spot instances can bring you up to 90% saving. That's a lot of saving. Why did you say it does not work for us? Well, you may be able to take advantage of this billing method, but your work needs to meet certain conditions. Spot instances are AWS spare capacity, and that's why they are so cheap. 
However, AWS may claim them back by giving you a two minutes warning. Your work should be tolerant to interruptions. Then who would use this service? It sounds very unreliable. The service can be paused any moment. It works for some workloads. For example, a researcher that requires to do some processing on a data set and their work is not time sensitive and is tolerant to interruption can take advantage of this economical solution. I see, and what's the other option? Dedicated hosts. You remember we talked about multi-tenancy and how EC2 instances share resources of the underlying host? Yes, I remember that. When, for regulatory reasons or license limitations, multi-tenancy is not acceptable, a dedicated host is the right choice. And of course, they're the most expensive. Makes sense. It's clearly something that's not applicable to Joy Pizza. By choosing the right pricing model, you can save a substantial amount of money. But like many other options you have in AWS, one size doesn't fit all. When it comes to EC2 pricing, you have five options. On-demand EC2 instances can be stopped and restarted based on your need, and you get charged for the time you use them. If you know you have a minimum usage, commit to it and take advantage of the saving that comes with the saving plans model. For cases that you need a server to run for the next one year or three years, choose the reserved model and save the most. Your workload is not time sensitive and tolerates interruptions? Go with spot instances. And finally, you have to be compliant with some regulations that does not allow multi-tenancy. You have only one option and that's a dedicated host. Joey, you said you need four servers on regular days. Yes, I expect about 200 orders on a regular day. And my IT team says one server should be able to handle about 50 orders easily. I see, but this is the average, right? Yes, if online orders follow the same pattern I see at my pizza store, I expect more customers on Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. The rest of the week is usually not as busy as these days. You know, I think I have last week's report. Let me show you. Yes, please. You see, Wednesday to Thursday is busier. I also have a report that shows the number of orders during each day. You do? Yes, look at this report for last Friday. We open from 10 a.m. and are open until 10 p.m. We have only a few customers before noon, but between noon and 1 p.m., sometimes there's a lineup at the store. And in the evening between 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. is the busiest time. How many pizzas did you sell last Friday? Let me see. Oh, here, 336 pizzas. It is above the daily average. It is very clear that your workload is not evenly distributed during the day and week. That's right. Last Friday, the line was so long that I got a few complaints from customers. Even a couple of them left the line after waiting for about 20 minutes. I lost those customers. I don't want something like that to happen on the Joy Pizza website. Then why don't you add more servers? It is because of the cost. I'm happy that EC2 instances are less expensive comparably, but still, during the less busier hours, I will have a number of servers sitting idle. It doesn't make sense from the business perspective to have a low utilization of resources I'm paying for. I think I know what we can do, Joy. Chandler explained to us how easy it is to start and stop EC2 instances. I think we should take advantage of this capability. That's a brilliant idea, Ross. I can give the IT team a schedule. Based on the reports we have, I can guess the number of orders we will have during the next hour. They will provision the right number of EC2 instances or stop them. We will always have the right number of servers. It both satisfies customers' needs and makes sense financially. And you know, even if something unpredicted happens and you need more servers or less of them, the IT team still can make changes accordingly. Amazing, I like that. The downside I see is the work we are creating for our IT team to manage the required servers, starting and stopping them all the time based on the demand. 
Guys, I'm proud of you coming to this conclusion on your own. Just one thing. Instead of making this an additional task for your IT team, you can delegate it to Amazon EC2 auto-scaling. Really? Yes, your problem, Ross, is not unique. It is a common known issue that workloads usually vary, and either over-provisioning or provisioning anything less than for the peak has some drawbacks. Ideally, you want to have the right number of servers at any given time. And this goal can be achieved by a scalability of the system which is having the ability to grow and shrink capacity based on your business needs. And since this is a common and undifferentiated capability, AWS has created a service for it which is called AWS Autoscaling. You begin your business with only the number of servers you need and configure AWS to automatically respond to workload and scale your servers out or in. And interestingly, you and Joey describe the two approaches for auto-scaling, which are predictive and dynamic. Your solution of having a schedule to scale out or in based on information you have about your business is predictive scaling. The second approach is dynamic scaling, like what Ross said. The system responds to the changing demand automatically. And even better, you can combine the two approaches, meaning have a plan ahead, but if things go differently than you planned, your architecture is smart enough to respond to the demand and the scale. Let me show you how it works. Yes, please, I'm interested to see it in action. First, log into AWS Management Console and click on EC2 from the list of services. On the left collapsible menu, open the auto-scaling option and you see launch configurations and auto-scaling groups. For now, let's not worry about the launch configuration. But if you're curious, it is where you choose the server image you want to spin up for your solution. That image also includes the software and applications you want to be installed on your virtual machine. It is a blueprint for creating my server. That's right, you can call it a blueprint too. More precisely, it is an image that allows AWS to spin up the server you want. Now, let's go to auto-scaling groups. This is where the magic happens, and it is also nicely explained on this diagram. When you configure your auto-scaling group, you identify a minimum number of servers, a desired capacity, and the maximum number of instances. I can guess what those means. Go ahead, Russ. What do you think they mean? Well, minimum probably means we always want to have at least that number of servers. For example, for Joy Pizza, I think we want to have at least two servers at any given time. And maximum means even if the load goes high, we do not want to pass the maximum number of servers. What would that number be for us, Joy? Hmm, I guess eight. I do not expect to need beyond six servers, but leaving some room, I would say eight but I definitely don't want to have more than eight. And I'm not sure what desired means, Chandler. Can you explain it? Desired is the number of instances you want to start with. I guess, in your case, you wanted it to be four. After they are spun up, based on the scaling policies that you have defined and the actual load, the number of servers may increase or decrease, but they will never be more than the maximum or less than the minimum you identified. Another feature and benefit of auto-scaling is that it makes your system fault-tolerant. What do you mean? You can define some health check rules for your instances. For example, an expected response from an endpoint. Auto-scaling will frequently check the health status of your instances and terminate an unhealthy instance and replace it with a fresh one. That's cool. I was thinking about the availability. I trust we have developed a robust application, but you never know what happens in production. And I was worried what would happen if one of the servers, or worse, if you act up. You are correct, you always need to plan for failure. And auto-scaling helps you create your desired redundancy and fault tolerance. You won't have a single point of failure anymore. And how much does it cost us to use auto-scaling? Nothing. The auto-scaling service is free. It is. Yes, it is free. 
you only pay for the resources you use, meaning for the instances you run, and only for the period of time they are running. This all sounds very exciting, but one question, how do requests get distributed between these servers? Is it randomly? I know the answer to that question. I have done my research on how to distribute load between multiple servers. And the answer is using a load balancer. I have even checked out a few of them and analyzed their pros and cons. But from what I have seen, I guess Chandler says AWS has a load balancer service too, because it is a common IT functionality. You are 100% correct, Joey. It does, and it's called Elastic Load Balancer, or short ELB. ELB works hand-in-hand -hand with the auto-scaling service and routes the requests to running EC2 instances based on the current load on each server. What do you consider the ELB advantage over other load balancing software I investigated? In my opinion, the most important benefit of ELB is that it is a managed service. There are multiple services in AWS that are managed, and the good thing about them is that you don't need to worry about their maintenance, security, update, or scaling. They are all managed by AWS. You simply use them. ELB is one of them. It is highly available and it automatically grows with your traffic. Configure AWS Auto Scaling properly and your architecture becomes smart enough to scale out or in based on either a given schedule, the live demand, or a combination of both. Your architecture would be scalable. It is a good time to clear up the difference between scalability and elasticity. These two terms are related, but not the same. Scalability is the ability of the system to accommodate larger loads by adding resources. And it can be achieved in two ways, either making hardware stronger or scaling up or adding additional nodes or scaling out. AWS Auto Scaling makes a system scalable using the second method, which is scaling out. Elasticity is a related but broader concept. The purpose of elasticity is to match the resources allocated with the total required capacity at any given point in time. So, it is correct to say AWS Auto Scaling feature is one of the services that enables you to create an elastic solution with AWS. With more than one server doing the work, something needs to distribute the load as evenly as possible between them. That's the job Elastic Load Balancer, or ELB, is designed to do. You learned about the public-facing ELB that receives traffic from the web users and distributes it between running EC2 instances. But ELB has another application too. In a decoupled system, you may want to make your backend resources redundant. ELB can sit between the front-end and back-end fleet and handle the traffic distribution. Hey Trey, how is the business? It's going pretty well, but we had a hiccup in our soft launch today. What happened? We tested our online order system. When we receive an online order, the server communicates directly with our application at the shop that displays the order details on a screen for bakers. The first few orders went well, but I think some networking issue between our EC2 instance and the display application resulted in the next orders getting lost. I think the problem is with your architecture that is tightly coupled. What do you mean? It is very common that components of an application need to send messages to each other and communicate frequently. If they communicate directly, they are less fault tolerant. I recommend you change your design to a more loosely coupled architecture and it will make your system more reliable. How can I do that? by introducing a buffer between the components of your application. A buffer? Yes, a buffer can sit between your online order EC2 and the display component. The online order component adds a message to the buffer for each order it processes, and the message includes all the order data 
also known as payload. The display component reads or consumes messages from this buffer. How is it different from our current design? The difference is in the buffer that decouples the components of your application. In this architecture, if your display component has a delay or does not work for a short period of time, none of the orders will be missed. And your online order component does not even know what happened on the other side of the buffer. It simply adds a message to the buffer for each order received. And I guess AWS has a service called Buffer. <laughs> you are half correct. In fact, AWS has two services for this purpose. They are called Simple Queue Service or SQS and Simple Notification Service or SNS. In this case, I recommend you use SQS. And out of curiosity, how SNS is different from SQS? Why don't you recommend SNS? SQS is an ordered queue of messages. First message received is the first message coming out of the queue, which I think is important to you in your case. That's right. Well, first of all, SNS does not guarantee keeping the order of messages. But more importantly, it is fundamentally a different way of messaging. SNS is based on the publisher-subscriber model. You create an SNS topic and define a publisher that can publish messages to this topic. So far, it looks similar to SQS. But with SNS, multiple subscribers can subscribe to the same topic. Once the publisher publishes a message to the topic, all the subscribers get a copy of the same message. And what can be a subscriber? It can be an email address or an HTTP endpoint or even a SQS. It can also be a push notification to a mobile. I see. I think I have an application for SNS too. You do? What's that? If it can send messages to an email address and the push notification to a mobile for the same payload, it would be the perfect solution for notifying my customers when their pizza is ready for pickup. Well done, Joey. You're right. Just keep in mind that SNS can also be used for internal components of your application to talk to each other. It is not limited to sending messages to your end users. SQS and SNS are two messaging services at your disposal. SQS is a good choice for building a distributed application with decoupled components. A pay-per-use AWS service for storing messages in transit between microservices. SNS has a different model and set of applications. It can deliver a message sent by a publisher to a topic to one or multiple subscribers. For example, the same event can asynchronously be delivered to a microservice to take an action, to a mobile device to show a push notification, and to S3 to keep a log. Joey, now that you have learned about EC2 instances and you know how to scale and distribute traffic, are you interested in learning about an alternative? An alternative to EC2 virtual machines? I thought we have plenty of options with all the instance types AWS offers for EC2. You're right, you have plenty of options to choose the configuration of your EC2 instance. And when it comes to computing, EC2 is the right choice in many cases. However, I think it is worth knowing about a managed compute service that AWS offers called Lambda. What do you mean by managed? When you run EC2 instances, it is up to you to install operating system updates and keep your instance secure. Also, when demand increases, you should plan for a scaling, like we talked about. AWS Lambda automatically scales and you don't need to worry about its availability or scalability. I see, and how is it different from EC2? With Lambda, you cannot access the underlying server. You mean I cannot log in to the server? No, the server that runs Lambda is hidden from you. Then how can I deploy my application? You upload your code to what's called Lambda function and define a trigger for it. And what's a trigger? A trigger is the event that upon happening, 
you want to invoke your Lambda function. For example, it can be receiving a request over HTTP or you can connect the SQS to your Lambda so that when a new message arrives in the queue, your code runs. Interesting. I still am not sure why I would use Lambda. It depends on your application. I'm not suggesting that you should always choose Lambda over EC2. In fact, one of Lambda's limitations is that processing each request should not take more than 15 minutes. And therefore, it is not a suitable computing solution for processes such as deep learning. But if your workloads are lightweight, you may want to consider Lambda. It is managed, therefore saves you some operational costs. And it can also be cheaper than EC2 instances running all the time. And one last consideration about Lambda is that your architecture should be event-driven. Not all existing software can run in Lambdas, but most of them can easily run on an EC2. AWS Lambda is a managed serverless compute service that runs your code in response to events and automatically scales as the load grows. Chandler, is there any other computing services you have not mentioned yet? There is actually one more called Fargate. And what's that? Could it be a better choice for Joy Pizza? It might. In order to explain it to you, I need to give you some background about containerized applications and Docker. Are you familiar with it? I've heard of it before. I think it is a form of virtualization at operating system level. Exactly, you're right. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Docker is a platform as a service solution. You package your software as a Docker container. And Docker has an engine that runs on a variety of operating systems. Therefore, the software developer does not need to worry about the underlying OS. You mean the same code can run on different flavors of Linux or versions of Windows? You got it, Russ. And in AWS, these containers run on top of EC2 instances and in isolation from each other, similar to how virtual machines work. Now, for containerized applications, usually you need to run a number of containers together, which is called a cluster. And some orchestration tool is needed to manage them at scale. AWS provides two of them. Elastic Kubernetes Service or EKS and Elastic Container Service or ECS, which both run on top of EC2 instances. But if you do not like managing the underlying EC2 instances, you can go with a managed service for containerized applications, which is AWS Fargate. Fargate works with both EKS and ECS. You can use Elastic Kubernetes Service EKS or Elastic Container Service ECS to orchestrate a cluster of container-based applications in AWS. And the containers can run on EC2 or use Fargate, which is a managed service for containerized applications. This is a good time to go over all AWS compute services we talked about and see what you should use when. If you want to host a traditional application and need full access to the underlying operating system like Linux or Windows, go with EC2. If you have some service-oriented or event-driven application that is composed of short-running functions and you don't want to manage the underlying environment, serverless AWS Lambdas are the best choice. And finally, if you want to run Docker container-based workloads on AWS, you first need to decide for your orchestration tool. Choose between Amazon ECS and Amazon EKS. After choosing the orchestration tool, you need to pick your platform. And for that, you have two options, EC2 instances and Fargate, which is a serverless managed environment.
With all these services that AWS offers, I guess they have a huge data center. Where is it located? Is it in Seattle, somewhere close to Amazon headquarters? Interestingly, not in Seattle. One of AWS data centers is in Oregon, which is not far from Seattle. Let me tell you more about how AWS global infrastructure is designed. It helps you when you architect your application and provision resources. I can make a wild guess from you mentioning global infrastructure that AWS has more than one data center and they're probably in different geographic locations. You're on a spot. That's exactly correct. And it is designed that way for two main reasons, high availability and low latency. I understand low latency. The closer the services, the faster they will be for the end user. But high availability could be achieved with having redundant resources in one data center, right? Not necessarily. You could have some level of high availability with having redundancy in one data center. If, for example, the underlying host has an issue and your other host can cover for it because it is isolated. But what if something happens to the whole data center, like a power outage? I expect a data center at the scale of AWS data centers to have emergency power backup. And they do. But things can happen, like an earthquake, flood, or a major network issue. I see, true. For that reason, and to provide high availability and fault tolerance, AWS has a number of data centers across the globe that are organized in what's called availability zones and regions. Okay, now you lost me. Data centers, I get, but what is an availability zone or a region? It is very simple. These terms describe the grouping of the data centers and how they're connected and organized. Each availability zone consists of one or more separate data centers equipped with redundant power and network. They should not be far from each other. You're correct. And a number of these availability zones together form a region. I guess they're also not very far, right? Because you call them a region. Well, availability zones are located far enough from each other to mitigate the risk of more than one getting impacted by an event and close enough to have low latency in communication between each other. Usually, this is about within 60 miles or 100 kilometers. I think I got it. So AWS has a number of regions across the globe. Each region consists of a number of availability zones and each availability zone has one or more data centers. That's right, and they all are connected with a high-speed fiber network. Okay, it was not that complicated. So where are these regions? Is it public information? Oh yes, of course. Actually, that's why I told you it is helpful you know more about the AWS global infrastructure. When you provision resources like EC2 instances on AWS, you choose in which region you want them. I see, that's interesting. So what are the regions? An easy way to find a list of regions is to log into AWS Management Console and click on the list in the top navigation. You see, it has a list of all current AWS regions. The list may grow in future. Tokyo, Sydney, London, I see, it is across the globe. I see that in your account, US East 1, which is North Virginia, is highlighted. That's correct. That means, by default, I'm creating resources in this region. But that's not always the best choice. You should consider a number of factors when you're deciding on the region you want to create your resources in. First, see if there is any compliance or regulatory that dictates the region. For example, some governments require their data not to leave the country, and in this case, the region is selected for you. But you said all regions are connected together by a high-speed network. They are connected, but by design, each region is isolated from other regions and data does not leave a region without your explicit permission and comment. 
Well, I think this factor does not apply to me. I'm not dealing with a government body. I want to choose what gives my users the best experience and makes sense for my business. Then you need to think about the next factors on the list. Proximity, feature availability, and pricing. Proximity means choosing a region that's closer to your end user to minimize the latency. The next factor is looking at the features you need in your architecture. Some services may be available only in a specific region, and your choices will be limited to them. And lastly, the pricing can be different between regions because of the difference in operational costs. I have two questions about what you explained. First, do you mean EC2 or ELB may not be available in some regions? Oh no, they are available in all regions. Some newer or more specialized services may not be available in all regions. All common services like EC2, ELB, SQS, and SNS are available in all of them. Okay, and my second question is about proximity. We have plans to franchise Joy Pizza and we will have users from all around the globe. It will be hard to choose between regions. We could choose London because we will have branches in London, but then our customers in the US probably won't have the best experience. That's a valid question. You need a CDN to get connected to your users faster. Right, I've heard about CDN, you mean content delivery network, like Akamai or Key CDN. Exactly, CDN providers have locations all around the globe to bring data closer to the end user. And I guess AWS has a CDN service too, right? Correct, and it is called CloudFront. CloudFront is the AWS CDN service. Is it correct to assume that AWS has a CDN location at least for all the regions you showed me? It is, AWS CloudFront locations are called edge locations, and as of early 2022, there are 218 edge locations across the globe, far more than the 25 AWS regions. You can, for example, cache the static components of your website and your site visitors will have a better experience with the content getting delivered to them from the closest edge location instead of where your server is located. And remember that edge locations do more than content delivery. They also help with Route 53, which is AWS DNS service. I now have a clear understanding of AWS global infrastructure, but I'm not sure how it helps my resources to be more available. It depends on the resource you're using. For example, as a best practice, you can run EC2 on at least two availability zones for high availability. The availability zones are provided by AWS, but it is up to you to use them properly. However, many AWS managed services like ELB, SQS, and SNS are regional constructs, meaning they are designed to run over multiple availability zones. So with no additional cost and without your involvement, they are highly available. Great. Anything else about the AWS global infrastructure? If you need to extend AWS infrastructure to your on-premise data center, you can use AWS Outposts. It is a fully managed service that offers the same AWS infrastructure, AWS services, APIs, and tools to your on-premise facility for a hybrid experience. Utilizing the AWS global infrastructure properly, your system will be available and speedy. AWS global infrastructure includes 25 regions. Each region has a number of availability zones, which are composed of discrete data centers. AWS has 80 availability zones in 2022. It is likely that AWS expands this global reach. Consider factors such as regulations, proximity, service availability, and cost when choosing the region for hosting your services. By design, data cannot be transferred out of a region to another region unless explicitly permitted. And take advantage of CloudFront. 
the AWS Content Delivery Network that reduces the latency of accessing static assets. The data centers that deliver your content to your users are called edge locations. You showed me the AWS Management Console. Is it the only way I can create and configure the resources I need for Joy Pizza? No, that's one way. And since it is visual, I recommend you start with exploring the AWS Management Console and find more details about the services like EC2. I see then what are the other ways to interact with AWS services and do they have any advantage over AWS Management Console? Besides the AWS Management Console that's accessible both through browser and the mobile app, there are two other ways. You can use Command Line Interface, CLI, or a Software Development Kit, SDK, that's available in various languages. They both sound more complicated than the console you showed me. Working with them requires a little bit more learning about AWS, but you asked a good question if they have any advantage over AWS Management Console. Well, they do. While the Management Console is easy to navigate, it is not the best tool to use for a production environment. Why is that? Provisioning resources through the Management Console is slow. You need to click and type in configurations, and that's a slow process. Just think if someone needs to configure several resources in AWS. More importantly, it is an error-prone process. What if when you create your next server, you miss a configuration? Right, I understand the value. So CLI and SDK let me automate the provisioning process? That's right. You want to have a predictable environment, and automation is the key. You can send comments to AWS to take actions such as starting your EC2 instance directly from the command line of your Windows or Mac machine. This command starts an EC2 instance with the given ID. Now the good thing about it is that you can combine a series of commands and create a rerunnable script. The script will always do the same thing and you have protected yourself from the risk of missing a setting. I see, that's pretty neat. It requires a bit more investment of time up front, but I can see the benefit of it. How is it different from the SDK? It is quite similar with the difference that SDKs are available in different languages. A good example is receiving messages from an AWS SQS in a microservice that you have developed in Java. You need to be able to connect to that SQS and collect any available messages directly from code. This line in Java does the job. I like it, so I start with the management console and I can give directions to my IT team to use CLI commands for scripting and to my development team to use SDK for interacting with AWS resources from our application. That's right, and it may help to know all of this magic is powered by an underlying set of APIs that you do not need to worry about. APIs stands for Application Programming Interface, and this set of APIs define predetermined ways to interact with AWS services. AWS Management Console, CLI Command, and SDKs all use APIs to perform the requested task. You can think of them as different proxies that perform what you intend by calling the corresponding APIs. I see. So. Going back to provisioning, I think the first step for my IT team is to define the list of the resources, including EC2, auto-scaling, and ELB, and script them so we can easily run them and expect the same result. That's right, an automated build enables you to create a development, staging, and production environment that are configured the same and behave as you expect. But let me tell you about two other powerful options that you can use as an alternative to CLI scripts for automating the provisioning process and building your environments. What's different about them? Why should I confuse myself why I can script my infrastructure in CLI? 
The advantage of these tools is that they are both managed services and are suitable for more complex designs. Reading, understanding, and modifying a CLI script can get challenging if you have many AWS components that interact with each other in your design. The first tool is called Elastic Beanstalk. You provide your application code and the desired configuration, including load balancing, auto-scaling, and health monitoring, and Elastic Beanstalk provisions the EC2 instances for you along with the other associated services. Let me show you how it works. Choose Elastic Beanstalk from services. Click on Create Application. Give your application a name. From the platform dropdown, choose the language your application is developed in, and you have the option to upload your code or start with the sample application. It creates the whole environment for you. I like how little information I need to provide to create the environment, but I didn't see the scaling and health settings. Good observation. You will need all these options as soon as the environment is created for you. And you said there is still another option? Yes, it is called AWS CloudFormation. CloudFormation is an infrastructure as code tool. You treat your resources and infrastructure as code, meaning you define the resources you want to create in CloudFormation templates that can be written in YAML or JSON. And then CloudFormation engine reads the template and provisions the resources for you in a repeatable manner. It can even roll back the changes to the environment if it comes across a blocker. But I still do not see the advantage of it over CLI script. The cloud formation templates are more human readable. They're more descriptive. For example, this JSON declares an SQS entity. And remember that both Binstock and cloud formation are free services. You only pay for the resources you provision using these tools. You have multiple options for provisioning resources in AWS. To start with AWS and for some one-off changes, AWS Management Console is the right choice because it is accessible through a web browser and AWS mobile app and it is visual. So very easy to understand. CLI scripts provide a reliable and repeatable way of creating environments and SDKs allow you to access and interact with AWS resources through your software application. Elastic Beanstalk is one layer of abstraction above EC2 and helps you set up a whole environment that consists of your code, EC2 configuration, ELB, and auto-scaling group. For more complex environments that may include components such as SQS and SNS, CloudFormation is a great tool. This infrastructure as code tool accepts human readable templates written in JSON or YAML and provisions the resources for you. Both Beanstalk and CloudFormation are free and you only pay for the resources they create for you. Chandler, my IT team has some concerns about the security of putting my resources in the cloud. They think it may not be as safe as having them in a data center. Why do they think a data center is safer? Because they have control over who has access to what, and they define rules that limit the access on the network level, and not just at the application layer. They have a valid point. You cannot just drop resources in the cloud, and AWS has a solution for it. And what is that? You can group your resources and create virtual boundaries around them. And you can do that in two levels. Think of it as cities with fortified walls. Each fort is secured and nothing can go in or out without permission. In addition to that, you can put your resources in a building in the right fort. And access to each building has its own rules. I see what you're trying to explain with this example. But can you map your example to my case? Yes, that's a good way of describing it. The fortified cities in AWS are called virtual private clouds, and inside them you can have multiple subnets that would be your buildings. A VPC is your private network in the cloud. 
that sets boundaries around your resources. With VPCs, you are creating an isolated section of the AWS cloud for yourself. How does this work with what we have talked about? For example, my EC2 instances. EC2 instances and ELBs all should be located in a VPC. In fact, AWS already has created a default VPC just for you and your account, and when you create an EC2 instance, it places it in that VPC. But you're allowed to change the configuration of your default VPC or create other VPCs. You also mentioned something about building inside the forts. What did you mean to explain with that analogy? Right, you do not want to treat all resources like each other. For example, some of your resources, like your database server, very likely should not be public facing. You want to protect and limit access to it on the network level. That's correct, and that was one of the concerns of my IT team. Well, buildings or subnets are enabling you to do that. With VPC, you provision a logically isolated section of AWS cloud. Then inside the VPC, you create subnets and group resources in them. These subnets each use a block of IP addresses and therefore are separated from each other. Let's look at the architecture of your system. What are the main components of your system? In the simplified architecture, we have EC2 instances that run our online store website and they interact with the database. What do you suggest in this case? First, you need a VPC. All your resources need to be in a VPC. Next, I believe your end users don't need to have access to the database, right? No, they don't. I want them only to be able to get to the web servers, but the web servers should be able to access the database to store a record of the orders. Then we need two subnets in the VPC. One we use as a public subnet and the other one as a private subnet. Makes sense, I will put the EC2 instances in the public subnet and the database in the private subnet. Exactly. But how do I make a subnet public or private? Is there a configuration setting for it? No, it is not like that. We call those subnets private and public because that's how we want them to behave. But you can achieve that by setting rules for what traffic can get into and out of each subnet. But first, I need to take a step back and tell you that by default, your VPC does not allow any traffic from or to the internet. You haven't installed a gate for my fort. Precisely, and that gate is called Internet Gateway. To allow your VPC to access the internet, you need to attach an Internet Gateway to your VPC. But what about my two subnets in the VPC? Now, they both have access to the internet, but I wanted only my public subnet to be public facing. Good question. You remember that I told you subnets are like buildings inside the fort? So you still have a door and a doorman in front of the building that checks who is allowed in or out. And that doorman is called Network Access Control List or in short, Network ACL. Network ACL is stateless, meaning it has no memory of the packets and checks every single one of them. Okay, I think we are getting closer, but I still don't know what I should do to make my private and public subnets behave differently. The default network ACL allows all inbounds and outbounds traffic, but if you create a custom network ACL and associate it with a subnet, it will deny all inbound and outbound traffic. You can create a custom network ACL for your private network and limit traffic to only the IP range of the public subnet. This way, your EC2 instances can access the database, but the public internet traffic is not allowed in the private subnet. So with configuring the network ACL of my private subnet, I will disallow the internet traffic. But doesn't it mean that my IT team would also not be able to access the database? That's correct. And to fix the issue, you give them special access by attaching a virtual private gateway to your VPC. 
A virtual private gateway allows traffic only from an approved network. Then you can access your database through an encrypted VPN connection. That means my VPC will have two gateways attached to it. Correct, and that's okay. One VPC can have multiple types of gateways attached to it for the different types of resources residing in its subnets. And you know, instead of a VPN that operates over the internet, you can even use AWS Direct Connect service, which provides you a physical direct line between your site and AWS. You mean a physical line from my main branch to AWS? Yes. Why would I need that for? Mainly for extra security and speed. Great, I know how to create a VPC, attach an internet gateway to it to allow internet traffic and how to create subnets within my VPC for public facing resources and backend resources. There is one more thing that I believe you need to know about security. In addition to network ACL that allows you to manage traffic in or out of subnets, you can manage instance level access for your EC2 instances with what's called security groups. Why would I need an additional layer of security on top of network ACLs? I limit the network traffic in and out a subnet to what I want. Why should I care about security groups and EC2 level access control? Well, I can think of two reasons from the top of my head. One, it secures your resources even more. So if you by mistake have let some unwanted traffic on subnet level, you can stop it at instance level. And more importantly, you may not want the exact same access on all your EC2 instances. For example, you may have a mail server that will also be public facing and resides in the public subnet and has SMTP protocol open while you have closed this protocol on your web servers. I didn't think of that. Now that you explained, I think I will need that level of flexibility, being able to control the traffic on an instance level. Is it like the default network ACL that all traffic is allowed by default? Or is it like a custom network ACL that all traffic is denied by default? <laughs> Sorry, it's like neither of them. The default security group attached to an EC2 instance allows no inbound traffic and allows all outbound traffic. Nothing in, but anything can go out. Exactly, your instance can send information out, but it is protected from any traffic into it. You can of course change those rules as suits your needs. Security is of the utmost importance for cloud service providers, including AWS, and you are empowered to configure multiple layers of security for your resources. It is up to you to design your network security the right way. VPCs, subnets, network ACLs, and security groups enable you to design the network security you desire. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC, provides you a logical isolated section of AWS. Your account comes with a default VPC. To allow internal traffic in and out of a VPC, you need to attach an internet gateway to it. A VPC can have multiple gateways, including a virtual private gateway. Subnets are partitions of a VPC separated by the IP ranges defined for them. Network Access Control Lists, or ACLs, provide your granular control over the traffic in and out of subnets and let you create public or private subnets. Security groups are virtual firewalls for EC2 instances that control incoming and outgoing traffic. And it is good to remind that for default VPC ACL, all inbound and outbound traffic is allowed. In a custom VPC ACL though, no inbound or outbound traffic is allowed. And in the default security group, no inbound traffic is allowed, but all outbound traffic is allowed. Chandler, I have some static assets for my website, such as images and JavaScript files. 
I was thinking how I should copy them to my servers when they scale. I mean, how to have the same set of assets on a new server that spins up automatically because of auto-scaling. Let me tell you about all the storage services on AWS. And once you know your options and the applications of each, you can decide on the right choice. Okay, what are my options? You have four options. Volume storage, also known as ephemeral drive, simple storage service or S3, elastic block storage or EBS, and elastic file system or EFS. That's a long list and a bit confusing. I agree that you have multiple options, but they exist for a reason. And I think once I explain their applications and differences, it makes sense. Let's start with volume storage or the ephemeral drive. It is simply the storage that comes with an EC2 instance. This storage is called ephemeral because it exists only for the period the EC2 instance is running. When you stop or terminate an EC2 instance, any data stored on this storage will be lost. It means I should not save anything important on the instance storage volume. That's correct. And that's because every time an EC2 instance is created, it may run on a host other than the one it was previously running on. The ephemeral nature of the volume storage makes it only good for temporary data. For long-lasting data, you should pick either EBS or S3. They are the proper choices for storing data outside the life cycle of an EC2. And how should I know which one to choose? I assume they have different features and are designed for certain applications. That's 100% true. Let me first tell you the two most important differences between EBS and S3, and then I will explain some nuances. First thing to consider is that EBS are mountable volumes. You attach them to an EC2 instance, but unlike volume storage, data continues to persist on them after stopping and starting the EC2 instance. S3, on the other hand, is a standalone service. You can store data on it without requiring an EC2 instance. Think of S3 as Google Drive or Dropbox, a storage in the cloud. So EBS acts like the traditional disk storage for a server. Exactly. And that's the other difference between EBS and S3. EBS, as its name says, is a block storage, but S3 is an object storage. Okay, this difference is not very clear to me. Does this mean I cannot store certain types of files on each? No, it is less about the file types. It is more about what you want to do with them and their nature. In short, EBS is a better choice for files you want to modify frequently. And S3 is a better option when you treat your files as a whole, as an object. Let me clarify with a couple of examples. Would you choose EBS or S3 for storing Joy Pizza advertisement video when your team is editing the video? I guess I go with EBS because you said it is a better choice for files that are modified frequently. But I do not understand why not S3. I still can store my promotional video on S3, right? You can. But the reason I would recommend EBS is that with S3, you need to upload and download the whole file as an object. Unlike EBS, you cannot just change a block in the file and leave the rest untouched. I see, so it means any change to a file stored on S3 requires a complete overwrite of the file. Doesn't it make it less useful? It depends. Let's say you want to store a copy of your purchase receipts for Joy Pizza. Do you ever want to modify them? No, I don't. Now I get it. Let me then go back to my original question. I guess S3 is the right choice for storing static assets for my website. Precisely. So EBS is a mountable storage that is attached to an EC2 and S3 is a standalone service. 
EBS is good for storing data that needs block level modification like a database and S3 is good for storing files as objects. What are the other differences between them? EBS can store files up to 16 terabyte. The default storage type is SSD, but you have the option to choose HDD. S3, on the other hand, is virtually unlimited and you can store as many objects as you want on it and the maximum object size is 5 terabytes. What about data backup? How can I backup my data on EBS and S3? With EBS, you can create incremental backups, meaning every time you create a new backup of your EBS volume, it only stores the difference between the current data and the previous backup. And where is my EBS backup stored? Interestingly, on S3. EBS snapshots are stored on S3. Well, what about backing up data that is stored on S3? You don't need to back up data you store on S3. S3 comes with 9.9999999 or 11 nines availability and tolerates concurrent failure in two facilities. But you can still define a life cycle for your data stored in S3. What does a life cycle of data mean? Let me first tell you a bit more about different tiers of S3. You have access to five S3 tiers. S3 is standard, which we already talked about, and is a good choice for something like your website static assets, images of pizza toppings, icons, CSS files, and JavaScript files. Then you have S3 Infrequent Access or S3 IA, which is ideal for data that is infrequently accessed but requires high availability. It is the right option for storing backups or storing receipts of purchases for Joy Pizza. Then you have two S3 Glacier tiers, S3 Glacier for audition purposes and S3 Glacier Deep Archive. I can guess what Glacier is used for. Based on its name, I guess it is for storing data that is required even less frequently than what would be stored in S3 IA. You guessed correctly, Joy. Data retrieval from Glacier can take up to 5 hours, so it is a good choice for archiving. And what is the difference between the two Glacier tiers? Glacier for auditing purpose enables a vault lock. It means data can be written once and read many times, which is also known as the worm model. It is a good choice for auditing purposes because it guarantees data is not altered. S3 Glacier Deep Archive is good for storing, for example, a backup of your last year's sales. And you said there is a fifth one? Yes, it is called S3 Intelligent Tier. Based on the access pattern, it automatically switches between S3 Frequent and S3 Infrequent access to save you money. So with S3, I can choose between Standard, IA, Glacier for Auditing, Glacier Deep Archive, and Intelligent Tiering. With the use cases you provided for each, I feel comfortable making a decision on when to use what tier. But I think you mentioned something about the life cycle of data. What was that? Oh, right. You can define life cycle policies for objects you store in S3. For example, 30 days after the object is created in S3, it will automatically be moved to the IA tier and 30 days after to the Glacier tier. Do I have to define this policy for all objects I store in S3? No, you don't have to. This is just an option available and you can use it if you need it. And how can I organize my files in S3? I assume I can create folders, right? You can manage your files in S3 by storing them in buckets. Buckets are sort of an equivalent of a folder, with a big difference. You cannot create buckets inside buckets, so you have one level of organization. I see. Okay, I think I know everything about S3.
Yes, we talked about all the important features of S3. Just one other S3 feature that you may find helpful. S3 is capable of versioning objects. You can enable it for S3 bucket and S3 allows you to access a specific version of the object. I can think of some applications for it. For example, I can enable versioning for the privacy document I put on Joy Pizza website. I can always check the previous versions of the file. Great! We talked about ephemeral storage, which is the EC2 volume storage, and I know not to use it for storing data I want to persist. I think I have a good idea when to use EBS and for what applications choose S3. And I also feel comfortable with picking the right S3 tier. But I think there was another type of storage you mentioned that we didn't talk about. True, Elastic File System or EFS. And how is it different from EBS and S3? EFS is a managed file system. Therefore, unlike EBS, it scales up and down automatically. But the main difference between EBS and EFS is that EBS can be attached to only one EC2 instance at a time. But EFS is a shared file system, meaning it allows multiple instances access the data in EFS at the same time. I think I understand the concept of EFS, but I cannot think of an application for it. I have one application in mind. Are you planning to have a blog on Joy Pizza website? Yes, I do. I have a lot to say about pizza. Great! And what blogging software are you planning to use? Probably WordPress. Nice. What do you think would be the right storage for hosting your WordPress blog? I can host it on an EC2 instance. Oh, I know. And because I don't want to lose all the blog posts if the EC2 instance stops or restarts, I will use EBS for storing WordPress files and database. Good thinking, Joey. But what if your blog goes viral and you need to scale out to catch up with the load? Well, I will just do what you said. I will scale. I will create more EC2 instances with EBS attached to each. Right, you can do that. But first of all, you are paying for extra EBS that might not be needed. And more importantly, you have to keep the data on your EBS synced. Right, when I publish my next post, I don't know which EBS has got the post and I need to copy it to all other EBS. Exactly, it gets complicated. Unlike EBS that is an availability zone level resource and attaches to an EC2, EFS is a regional construct and any EC2 in the region can access it. So you can share the EFS with all your EC2 instances and they all read and update the same data. In this article, you can find more details and a comprehensive architecture on how multiple EC2 instances share an EFS. When it comes to a storage, AWS provides you four types of storage. Volume storage or ephemeral drive that has the same life cycle of an EC2 instance and is only suitable for storing temporary data. Elastic block storage or EBS, the right choice for storing data that needs frequent micro edits. For example, editing an 80 gigabyte video. Simple storage service or S3 is a managed service that can store millions of objects such as images and text files. S3 is the best choice when the file changes infrequently or changes completely. S3 is available in five tiers and depending on the frequency of access to the file, you should choose the right tier to save money. Elastic File Service or EFS is a managed and auto-scalable, shareable file system. Chandler, did I tell you about the loyalty reward card I'm planning to create for my good customers? No, that's a great idea. 
So customers collect points when they purchase pizza from Joy Pizza and they can claim the rewards point, right? Yes, I'm still working on the details of how many points to give for each pizza and things like that. But from the IT perspective, I know that my development team will need some database to keep track of the points collected by our customers. Since we are designing our whole architecture on AWS, I'm interested to know our options. Sure, I can give you an overview of what type of databases AWS offers. I think you are already familiar with Relational Database Management Systems or RDBMS. Yes, I know them. You're talking about relational databases. Data is broken down to logical tables that keep relationships with each other through IDs and foreign keys. Correct. And do you remember the language relational database commands are written with? I think it is Structured Query Language or SQL. That's correct. Let's review a couple of examples of SQL commands to refresh our memory. This command adds a record to a table called customers and stores a customer's information in it. And this command combines two tables, orders and customers, and runs a query that returns all the orders John has put. Yes, it all looks familiar now. So does AWS support relational databases? And which database engines does it offer? Amazon Relational Database Service, or RDS, supports all well-known engines. To be precise, you can create a database using any of the following engines in AWS. MySQL, PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, MariaDB, and Amazon Aurora. I think all these relational database engines are popular and standard engines, but I haven't heard of Aurora before. Amazon Aurora is the AWS most managed database engine. What do you mean by most managed? All databases on AWS are managed. For example, if you choose MySQL, you don't need to worry about installing the most recent patches and upgrades. Also, you can configure automated backups and redundancy, failover, and disaster recovery, as well as the security of your database, are all managed by AWS. I see, that's great, but then what is special about Amazon Aurora? Amazon Aurora is MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible, and in addition to the above, provides you data replication, continuous backup, and point-in-time recovery, all out of the box. And it could cost as low as one-tenth the price of the other database engines. So it can be a great alternative to MySQL or PostgreSQL standard engines. Exactly. Relational databases break down data into tables such as customers table or orders table and each table consists of rows and columns tables can have relationships that are maintained through keys aws relational database service or rds supports all popular rdbms engines including mysql postgresql microsoft sql server Oracle, MariaDB, and Amazon Aurora. Regardless of the engine, RDS is a managed service, and users don't deal with the updates and security of the database. Amazon Aurora is MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible, is highly managed, and more economical. Have you considered NoSQL databases for Joy Pizza? What is NoSQL? How is it different from relational databases? In NoSQL databases, the structure is more flexible. You don't have the same rigid schema that you have in relational databases. It sounds a bit chaotic and disorganized. You mean no columns? 
That's correct. No columns like relational databases. Instead of rows, you have items, and each item has a number of attributes. This sounds very similar to relational database structure. Then what's different about NoSQL? The difference is that unlike relational databases that all the rows in a table have the same number of columns, items in a NoSQL table can have different attributes. And what's the benefit of NoSQL? Why would someone choose NoSQL over SQL database? Some data requires this sort of flexibility. For example, think about the menu of your Joy Pizza. For pizzas, you have their nutrition facts, toppings, and size. But for the drinks, you have a different set of attributes. And same, for example, for sites such as breadsticks or desserts. So when the rigidness of data types and the schema that comes with traditional relational databases are limiting you, you can choose NoSQL. It helps to know that data is stored as key value pairs. An item could look like this. And does AWS have a NoSQL database engine? You bet it does. DynamoDB, a NoSQL serverless database. DynamoDB automatically scales up and down and stores data redundantly across multiple availability zones. It is massively scalable and highly performant. You can expect a response time of milliseconds even when dealing with huge amount of data. I wonder how you would query a non-relational database. The queries are simpler and you don't have a joint functionality like RDS. So mainly you run queries on single tables, but you can still filter the table for what you're looking for. For example, get a list of all the veggie pizzas. Could you clarify when I should consider DynamoDB instead of RDS? In general, when you're dealing with business analytics, it is probably a safer choice to stick with RDS because you likely need to run queries that combine data from multiple tables. But when you want to have flexibility in the data structure and type of the data you store, and traditional relational database schema makes design inconvenient, consider NoSQL and DynamoDB. Also, when performance is critical for you and you're dealing with a very large amount of data, you probably should consider DynamoDB. RDS join functionality creates overhead and impacts performance. DynamoDB is a fully managed, serverless, NoSQL database that AWS offers and is a good alternative to RDS when we want no defined schema or the performance is critical and we deal with massive data. Joey, I think it is worth you also know about another data related service from AWS called Redshift. Is it another RDS or is it a NoSQL database like DynamoDB? Actually, neither of them. When you're dealing with a large volume of historical data that vary, you may want to consider Redshift. Amazon Redshift is a data warehousing service that helps answering backward questions like what did happen? It is suitable for big data analytics. What do you mean by data that vary? I mean when the format and type of data is not homogeneous. For example, let's say you end up using both AWS RDS and DynamoDB because of your architecture needs and later want to do some analysis about the impact of a series of promotions you ran on your business. You need data from different types of databases. With Redshift, you can collect data from different sources and understand relationships and trends across your data. And of course, it is massively scalable and has a very high performance. Do you need big data BI solutions? Consider AWS Redshift. For historical analytics as opposed to operational analysis and when you need to deal with volume and variety of data, Amazon's data warehousing service can help. Mm -hmm. 
my IT team told me we already have some data from our local store customers. Can I move this data to AWS to be in the same environment as the data from the online shop? You certainly can. When it comes to migrating your database to AWS, you have two options. You can either lift and shift, meaning just moving your existing database to an EC2 instance, or you can migrate your data to one of the managed database services to benefit from automated patching, backups, redundancy, failover, disaster recovery, and security that comes with it. I see, I guess lift and shift is very simple and easy to do, but I like to learn more about how to migrate my existing database to one of the managed AWS RDS. It is hard to ignore the list of benefits of a managed RDS. I agree, it is definitely worth considering migrating to an AWS RDS. And to facilitate the process, AWS has created a tool specifically for this purpose called AWS Database Migration Service or DMS. DMS helps you migrate an existing on-premise database to the cloud. The great thing about DMS is that while you migrate your data between the source and the destination, your source can remain fully operational. If the engine of the source and target are of the same type, you have a homogeneous migration. For example, if your existing on-premise database for Joy Pizza customers is MySQL and you are migrating to AWS MySQL or AWS Aurora, things are simple and easy. But if the source and destination database engines are different, you're doing a heterogeneous migration and it needs to happen in two steps. The first step is converting the schema structure and following that, the migration of data happens. It all makes sense, but I'm worried I get lost in the process. You don't need to be worried. DMS is designed to walk you step by step and guide you through the process. And now that you learned about DMS, it is helpful to know it can help you in ways other than migrating your database to the cloud. How do you mean? You can use DMS for development and test, meaning testing applications against production data without affecting production users. Using DMS, you can copy some data from the production to the development environment and let your team test their changes with real data. You can also use DMS for consolidating databases, meaning you can combine several databases into a single database. And finally, you can use DMS for continuous database replication. AWS Database Migration Service, or DMS, allows you to migrate your existing on-premise database to the cloud. If the source and destination databases have the same engine, the migration is homogeneous and happens in one step. But if they are of different types, the migration of data follows the conversion of the schema structure. DMS has applications other than database migration, including development and test, database consolidation, and continuous database replication. Joey, I think so far we covered all you need to know about databases in AWS, at least anything that might be applicable to your business. And you have seen that we do not have a one-size-fits-all database in AWS. There are a few other database services that are worth mentioning. There are even more options? It is getting confusing. I know, and I think we can keep this part short because other than one item that I will highlight, the rest is just for you to be aware of their existence. I do not expect you need them for Joy Pizza. Amazon DocumentDB is a NoSQL JSON document database service that supports MongoDB workloads. Amazon Nepton is a graph database that is most suitable for recommendation and social network, where you need to track who is connected to who. You can use Amazon Neptune to build and run applications that work with highly connected datasets, such as recommendation engines, 
fraud detection, and knowledge graphs. Amazon Managed Blockchain is a service that you can use to create and manage blockchain networks with open source frameworks. Blockchain is a distributed ledger system that lets multiple parties run transactions and share data without a central authority. Amazon Quantum Ledger Database is most suitable for storing banking and financial records. Its immutable ledger does not allow any alterations or removal of data entries and is great for auditing. Amazon Elasticash is a service that provides a caching layer on top of your database and improves read time of command requests. Amazon Elasticash supports two types of data stores, Redis and Memcached. I think this service is the one that might become handy when Joy Pizza becomes popular. And finally, DynamoDB Accelerator, or in short, DAX, is an in-memory cache for DynamoDB. It improves response time from single-digit milliseconds to microseconds. In addition to AWS Relational Database Service that offers all popular relational database engines and DynamoDB for NoSQL databases, AWS has a number of other database services that are suitable for particular needs. DocumentDB for document databases, Nepton for graph databases, blockchain for creating and managing a blockchain network and quantum ledger for securing records from alterations, which is most suited for auditing. And you can improve the response time of databases by employing a proper caching mechanism. Elasticache is available for Redis and Memcache and DAX for DynamoDB. Chandler, who is compensating me if my customer's data gets stolen or the server stops working? Who is responsible? That's a good question, Joy. When you use AWS services, you agree to a shared responsibility model, meaning both you and AWS are responsible. But that doesn't make sense. Responsibility cannot be shared. It should be either AWS or me. I need to know who ultimately is responsible if, for example, a security incident occurs. You are correct, Joey. Only one entity should be responsible for an object. Otherwise, you will have dispute on any incident. Let's have a look at EC2 as an example. We talked about physical hosts in AWS data centers that run hypervisors, which in turn manage virtual machines or EC2 instances. Right, I remember that. Well, AWS is responsible for the physical security of the data center. It's networking, power infrastructure, the servers hosted in the data center, and hypervisors. But from this point on, meaning the operating system you install on the EC2, the applications you run on it, and your data are all your responsibility. AWS cannot even log into your EC2 instance, let alone manage it. It feels like there is a virtual line separating my responsibility from AWS. Exactly. You can say AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. And you, as an AWS customer, are responsible for the security of everything in the cloud. For example, it is on you to set the right permissions for an S3 bucket you create in your account. Also, it is your responsibility to configure the security groups of your EC2 instance properly to keep them safe. I say, is there any proof that AWS is performing its responsibilities? Yes, there is. Although you cannot visit an AWS data center in person and confirm AWS is doing what it has accepted as its responsibility, you have access to third-party audit reports that approve of AWS doing its part. 
These auditors verify AWS compliance with a variety of computer security standards and regulations. With AWS Shared Responsibility Model, you as the user of AWS services are responsible for everything you create in the cloud. And AWS responsible of the cloud, meaning its infrastructure, the security of physical data center, the servers, and hypervisors. I have created an account with AWS and now I want to give access to my IT and development teams to provision resources and make the proper configuration. But I don't think sharing my credentials is the right thing. What should I do? Sharing credentials is definitely not the right way to give others access to the account. Let me first remind you of a best practice which is turning on multi-factor authentication or MFA on your account. Another important thing about your account is that you as the owner of the account have the credentials of the root user. The root user has permission to do anything inside an AWS account. Therefore, it is recommended you create other users with limited access and log in with those users. And how can I create users? Using Identity and Access Management Service or IAM. In IAM, you can create users, groups, roles, and policies. And don't worry, I will explain them all to you shortly. When you create a user, by default, they have no permission and all access is denied. They even cannot log into AWS. You explicitly identify all users' permissions. It is advised you follow the least privilege principle and give a user the minimum required access. It makes sense. Okay, I understand the concept of having separate users. And I can guess groups are sets of users with the same level of permissions. But I haven't heard of the two other terms you mentioned, IAM policies and roles. IAM policy is a JSON document that describes what API calls a user can or cannot make. It simply describes a user's permission. Let me explain with an example. In this example, you are giving the user the permission to list all the objects in the S3 bucket toppings images. Any IAM policy has these three parts, effect, action, and resources. Effect is either allow or deny. Action is self-explanatory. You identify what action you want to allow or deny the user. And resource is the ID of the resource. A policy document can be attached to users or groups and describes in details what they have or not have access to. And what is a role? Roles are a helpful method for giving temporary access to resources. Like users and groups, you attach an IAM policy to a role to define what they have and don't have access to. I feel role is redundant. I can manage permissions to resources with users and groups. Why would I need using roles? You are correct. For most common and daily applications, you can manage users' permissions through IAM users and IAM groups. But roles become handy when you want to grant an entity temporary permission. Let me tell you about a few main differences between a role and a user. And maybe I can explain it for you better with an example. The first thing different about a role is that it does not have a username and password. An entity can assume a role. And while it is assuming that role, it gets all the permissions defined in the policy document attached to that role. The second characteristic of a role is that when an entity assumes a role, it abandons all the existing permissions and only has the permissions the role gives it. And finally, in addition to users, an application or an AWS service can assume a role too. 
This last statement about roles sounds a bit confusing to me. What do you mean an AWS service can assume a role? Let me explain it with an example. Imagine you have an EC2 instance that needs access to a S3 bucket only for a short period of its life cycle. Following the least privilege principle, you don't want your EC2 to always have access to the S3 bucket. You can define a role that has the right permission. Your EC2 assumes the role for the period it needs the access and after that, it won't have the access anymore. I think I understand the concept of roles. It is mainly used for giving temporary, credentialless access to resources. You summarized it pretty well. Now that you have learned about users, groups, policies, and roles, let me remind you of some of the best practices you should follow. Do not use the root user for everyday tasks. Instead, create users with only the necessary permissions. Even if you have multiple employees who require the same level of access, you should create individual IAM users for each of them. This provides additional security by allowing each IAM user to have a unique set of credentials. Follow the security principle of least privilege when granting permissions. IAM roles are ideal for situations in which access to services or resources needs to be granted temporarily. Consider utilizing them when applicable. You manage entities, meaning users, applications, and AWS services access to resources in the cloud using Identity and Access Management, or IAM. Users, groups, IAM policies, and roles equip you to grant granular access to entities. Users can log in to the AWS Management Console or access resources using their credentials. Groups simplify managing access for users that require similar permissions. Policies are documents in JSON format that define what action you allow or deny on a resource. Policy documents can be attached to a user, a group, or a role. Roles enable you to authorize credentialless and temporary access to AWS resources. Entities including users, applications, and even AWS services can assume a role. Now that we talked about managing access to your AWS accounts and the best practices around it, I think it is worth knowing about AWS Organization, a relevant service. AWS Organization is a central location where you can manage multiple AWS accounts. Why multiple AWS accounts? I don't think you need multiple accounts in the earliest stages of your business, but as your business grows, you may feel the need for it. For example, you may want to have a completely separate account for your development team. It can help both with tracking costs and additional security. If at any stage of your business, you have more than one AWS account, then you can use the free AWS organization tool for consolidated billing. Your primary account pays for all the grouped accounts and you benefit from the bulk discount. In large organizations, it could be useful to group accounts as organization units. For example, let's say Joy Pizza is franchised and has multiple development, IT, marketing, and business teams around the globe. For better tracking of expenses and access management, you have created a separate account for your development team in New Zealand, an account for your development team in the UK. Then you can create an organization unit that groups all development accounts together. Service Control Policy, or SCP, uses the same language as IAM and enables you to specify what resources an organization unit or AWS account should not have access to. When you apply a policy to an organization unit, all the accounts in the organization unit automatically inherit the permissions specified in the policy. 
However, you still can provide access for users, groups, and roles through IAM. AWS Organization is a service that allows managing multiple affiliated AWS accounts centrally. It brings their management under one umbrella and lets you group them into organization units. Service Control Policy or SCP can be attached to an account or an organization unit and establish permission guardrails that all IAM users and roles in the organization's account adhere to. I had a conversation with my lawyer and he wanted to make sure that by using AWS, we are not violating any compliance requirements. We are not dealing with a government body, but still things such as a data privacy and security standards are basic requirements of any business that has an online operation. I agree with you, Joey. You don't want to get a fine or get sued because of not following rules. The good news about AWS is that it is compliant with most regulations such as General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR. You can get access to all compliance and security reports on AWS Artifact. What is AWS Artifact? Artifact is a service that consists of two main sections, AWS Artifact Agreements and AWS Artifact Reports. You can review reports and manage agreements for all your accounts. You also get access to a large set of compliance reports from third-party auditors. These auditors have tested and verified that AWS is compliant with a variety of global, regional, and industry-specific security standards and regulations. Oh, that's great. It seems I'm covered. Yes, AWS takes security and regulation compliance seriously. For example, if you remember, I told you that data won't automatically be replicated across regions unless you explicitly allow it. And the main reason for this is to stay compliant with some regional regulations that require you to stay in the geographical area of a country or a state. However, I want to remind you that we also talked about the shared responsibility model. In this model, you own the data and it is your responsibility to protect it well. AWS is responsible for not allowing unauthorized users to access your data on your S3 bucket. But it is certainly your responsibility not to make your S3 publicly available if it contains personally identifiable information. AWS is compliant with most industry standard regulations and gives you access to third-party audits and reports. However, while it gives you peace of mind, you still need to do your part and keep your business and customers' data safe and secure based on the shared responsibility model. I was talking to my IT team the other night and they explained to me a common security attack called DDoS. And what is that? It is overwhelming the system to stop it from servicing our legitimate users. A malicious attacker would leverage a large number of machines over the internet and turn them into zombie bots. They all start to send concurrent requests to our site on behalf of the attacker. It results in overwhelming our services and brings them down. But why would someone do that? There are different vicious motivations behind it. For example, an attacker could ask for ransom. And there are apparently many different types of DDoS, including UDP flood, which is a low-level brute force attack, or a HTTP level attack, which is pretending to have slow connection and occupying the services. Oh, that sounds complicated. Exactly, and we need to have reasonable protection in place. I wonder if AWS can help us with DDoS protection too, or if we need to think about a third-party service. 
AWS certainly can help you with the DDoS protection. First of all, think about the amount of resources that exist in an AWS region. It would be massively expensive to overwhelm an AWS region, not impossible but close to it. Therefore, a well-architected system that is scalable is already protected against most malicious attacks. But with AWS Shield, it can be protected even more. Can you elaborate on the architectural considerations that help with DDoS protection? What do you mean by that? Sure, for example, you mentioned UDP flood. Well, a simple solution is to configure the security groups of the EC2 instances properly and close the protocols that are not needed. Or, if you have added redundancy to your system and have an ELB for distributing the load, a slow risk attacker that pretends to have a slow connection would only occupy one of the servers and could not block other legitimate requests. I see, and I guess AWS Shield is a service that gives additional protection to DDoS, correct? Exactly, AWS Shield creates additional defense blanket. Could you elaborate on that? AWS Shield has two tiers, standard and advanced. AWS Shield standard is free and is automatically enabled on your account protecting your resources from the most common, frequently occurring types of DDoS attacks. For any incoming network traffic, AWS Shield Standard uses a variety of analysis techniques to detect malicious traffic in real time and automatically mitigates them. AWS Shield Advanced is a paid service that provides detailed attack diagnostics and the ability to detect and mitigate more sophisticated DDoS attacks. AWS Shield Advanced also integrates with AWS services such as CloudFront, Route 53, and Elastic Load Balancing. A well-designed system in AWS benefits from the magnitude of AWS infrastructure and is automatically protected from basic DDoS attacks. AWS Shield is able to detect sophisticated DDoS attacks and can be integrated with a variety of AWS services. Securing your data has two parts. One, securing your data when it is stored, which is also known as securing data at rest, and transferring your data between a source and destination securely, which is known as securing data in transit. For example, when a new customer puts an order on Joy Pizza, their order gets processed by one of the servers. Then it is likely sent to a database to be stored for further actions or simply for creating the user profile or for analytics. What type of data do you think you're collecting from your users that needs to be treated securely? I guess both their email address and phone number. I agree, they're both important pieces of information. Now, securing a message or data in a way that only authorized parties can access it is called encryption. And to encrypt or decrypt data, you need keys. AWS Key Management Service makes creation and management of keys easy. You can choose the specific levels of access control that you need for your keys. For example, you can specify which IAM users and roles are able to manage keys. Your keys never leave AWS KMS, and you're always in control of them. I see, then AWS KMS does not encrypt or decrypt data. It is not independently securing data at rest or in transit. That's right, AWS KMS only simplifies key management for you. It is up to you to encrypt the data in your DynamoDB, which would be an example of securing data at rest, and encrypt the connection between your Redshift and MySQL client, which would be an example of securing data in transit. To secure data at rest, 
and data in transition, we need encryption algorithms and encryption keys. AWS KMS makes it easy to create and manage keys. You know how you want your IT team and security team to stay on top of the security of your system? Right. You can offload one of their tasks to Amazon Inspector. And how does Amazon Inspector help? Amazon Inspector is a service you can use for assessing the security of your EC2 instances. So it does not help with assessing the security of other services like my database or, for example, Lambda functions? No, it is an automated security assessment service that specifically checks for any unintended network accessibility of your Amazon EC2 instances and for any vulnerabilities on those EC2 instances. Amazon Inspector Agent is an entity that collects information about packages you have installed on your EC2 instance and reports to you if it spots a deviation from security best practices. And how do I know what changes I should make? AWS Inspector lists all security issues it has found on your EC2s and recommends remedies. AWS Inspector is a tool that can assess the security of your EC2 and provide a report of any deviation from security best practices. It checks both the network configuration of the EC2 and the software that is installed on it. AWS Guard Duty is another service that can provide your system additional security. It is a threat detection service that continuously analyzes streams of metadata generated from your account. What sort of metadata? Do you mean it checks my customer's information? No, it doesn't check your customer's data. It checks the network activity logs that can be found on AWS CloudTrail events, Amazon VPC flow logs, and DNS logs. And by continuously monitoring this information, it provides intelligent threat detection for your AWS infrastructure and resources. AWS Guard Duty provides intelligent threat detection by continuously monitoring network activity metadata and reporting any suspicious behavior. The online order application your team is developing for Joy Pizza is a web application. Correct, a very simple web application for now. Later, we may add the loyalty card to it. Well, then you may also want to consider AWS Web Application Firewall or WAF. It is trained by machine learning and lets you monitor network requests that come into your web applications. AWS WAF works together with Amazon CloudFront and an application load balancer. Do you remember we talked about network access control lists? AWS WAF works in a similar way to block or allow traffic, but instead of a network access control list, WAF controls traffic using a web access control list. AWS Web Application Firewall or WAF helps protect your web applications or APIs against common web exploits using a web access control list. Chandler, how can I stay informed about the health of my servers? Even in the beginning, I will have several resources running in the cloud. It would be great if we could automate some of the monitoring of our infrastructure. Otherwise, we need to pay a dedicated IT resource to keep an eye on it. You guys are completely correct. You need to be able to monitor your systems, meaning collect metrics, evaluate them, and make decisions or take actions, and preferably, you want to do all of this automatically.
For example, an EC2 instance may be overutilized. You can trigger a scaling event that automatically would launch another EC2 instance. Or an application may start sending error responses at an unusually high rate. You can send an automatic alert to an employee to take a look and investigate the issue. With these examples, I believe AWS has a service that would help with our monitoring needs. You bet, and it is called Amazon CloudWatch. Mm, that's a sensible name for a cloud monitoring service. CloudWatch is a web service that enables you to monitor and manage various metrics and configure alarms and actions based on data from those metrics. With CloudWatch, you can monitor the health of the operation of your infrastructure. It uses metrics to represent the data points for your resources. CloudWatch then uses these metrics to create graphs that show how performance has changed over time. That's interesting. What are those metrics? You said they are data points? Yes, metrics are variables tied to your resources. AWS services send metrics to CloudWatch and you can access all your metrics from a central location called CloudWatch dashboard. For example, you can monitor the CPU utilization of an Amazon EC2 instance, the total number of requests made to an Amazon S3 bucket, and more, all on your CloudWatch dashboard. You can even customize separate dashboards for different business purposes, applications, or resources. That would be very handy. I certainly see the need for our system. But you also mentioned something about sending a notification. It would save our people's time. They would not need to watch the dashboard all the time. Yes, CloudWatch Alarms is the service you are looking for. In CloudWatch, you can create alarms that automatically perform actions if the value of your metric has gone above or below a predefined threshold. For example, you know in normal conditions your EC2 instance CPU utilization should be around 40 to 60 percent. You can configure CloudWatch Alarm to send a notification to your IT staff if the CPU utilization goes above 70%. I think with proper employment of CloudWatch and its alarm system, we can reduce our mean time to resolution or MTTR as well. True, and we can also improve the total cost of operation or TCO. We can configure proper alarms to notify us if resource usage exceeds the expected levels. As a business owner, you need near real-time visibility into your infrastructure and CloudWatch empowers you to have it. Chandler, can I monitor the actions that take place in my AWS account? For example, when a new resource gets created or removed, it will help both with the security of the system and troubleshooting. Yes, you can. What you want is an auditing service. In AWS, CloudTrail keeps track of all the requests, so any action, including the changes you make through the AWS Console Manager, CLI scripts or SDK result in some AWS API calls. I am familiar with the API concept. It stands for Application Programming Interface and is a software intermediary that allows two computer programs to talk to each other and exchange comments and information. You are correct, and any interaction with AWS will result in an AWS API call. It could be creating a new EC2 instance through AWS Web Console or sending a message to an SQS by a Java application that utilizes AWS SDK. So all you need is auditing AWS API calls. And CloudTrail is that auditing tool. Exactly, CloudTrail is the comprehensive API auditing tool at your disposal. It records who did what, when, and from where. 
Let's look at the case when one of your IT team members creates an EC2 instance on AWS. CloudTrail logs what happened, which is the creation of an EC2 instance. It also shows you who did it, which in this case, a user named Susan from your IT team ran the command. You also find the exact timestamp of when it happened. And finally, you see how the command was issued. In this case, Susan used the AWS Web Management Console to create the EC2. I like the details that AWS logs, and it's more than I need. The CloudTrail engine is simple, yet very powerful and detailed. Besides the details I mentioned, it records the IP address from which the request was made. And if the command is successful, it records the new state of the AWS service. Interestingly, it even records a request that is denied and captures why it was declined. And where does AWS store all this information? That's an excellent question. It stores them in S3. And since S3 is virtually unlimited, the logs can be stored indefinitely. So if I need to analyze past events, I need to load that log that AWS has created for me and search for the relevant information. That's correct. It is on you to find the information you need within the CloudTrail log. However, you can use CloudTrail Insight, an optional feature of CloudTrail that allows you to automatically detect an unusual API activity. For example, if the rate of SQS messages rises above a certain norm, you get a notification so you can do further investigation and take proper actions. CloudTrail logs the details of every event in your account, including the timestamp, the user who takes action, what they did, and if it resulted in a state change. All CloudTrail logs are stored on S3, so virtually it is unlimited. CloudTrail Insight monitors all the events and sends you a notification if it detects unusual activity. I learned about many AWS services, and I already know I will use several of them. I wonder if I need to hire an advisor who can help me follow the best practices. That's a good idea, but it is worth knowing that AWS even provides this consultation in the form of a service. Really? Do you mean I can hire someone from the AWS team? You always have the option of hiring a consultant, but I'm talking about Trusted Advisor, a service accessible through the AWS Management Console. That's interesting, and how does it work? Trusted Advisor evaluates the resources you use against AWS best practices. Specifically, it checks them against five pillars, cost optimization, performance, security, fault tolerance, and service limits. Trusted Advisor is a web service that inspects your AWS environment and provides recommendations in these five areas. All findings are marked with an icon. Green means there is no problem with the finding. Orange means Trusted Advisor recommends further investigation about its finding. And red suggests Trusted Advisor has found items that require taking action. That sounds very interesting. Could you show me an example of a Trusted Advisor report? Sure, check out this screenshot. You see, in each of the five categories, findings are grouped in green, orange, and red. For example, 11 security findings require taking action and 7 performance related findings are worth further investigation. You get the idea. Trusted Advisor is a web service provided by AWS that checks your environment and resources against 5 best practices pillars and gives you a series of recommendations.
I have learned a lot about various AWS services that help me add online orders to Joy Pizza, but how much all of this will cost my business? That's an excellent question. As a business owner, you should know some AWS services are free, but with some limitations. So always check the AWS free tier. What do you mean free, but with limitations? Let me explain with some examples. First, some services like AWS Lambda, the serverless computing service, are always free but have a cap for the free tier. For example, the first 1 million invocations of Lambda functions in a month are free. But once your usage exceeds 1 million requests in a month, you will get charged. S3, on the other hand, is free for the first 12 months. Plus, your free usage is capped to 5 gigabytes. So once you go beyond 5 gigabytes of data on S3, you need to pay for it. And lastly, some other services like LightSail offer a free trial. As for LightSail, you can test it for one month and up to 750 hours. Okay, that's great about the free services, but what about after the trial? How does AWS pricing work? The pricing of each AWS service may depend on several different factors, but there are some common tools and concepts that I can share with you which make your life easier. Okay, tell me about them. First, you need to know about AWS Pricing Calculator. It is accessible at calculator.aws. It is easy to use. You choose each service you need, add your usage estimates, and get an estimation of the monthly cost. That's pretty handy. True, and a few concepts are standard through all AWS services. First, the AWS pricing model is pay-as-you-go, meaning you only pay for what you use, which applies to any service you include in your solution. While you do not have to commit to using a service for the long term, it makes sense to reserve it once you know they are needed. What would be the benefit of reserving resources? Am I getting a discount? You guessed correctly, and in some cases, it can be a significant discount. For example, EC2 Instance Savings Plan, another name for reserving EC2 instances, allow you to save up to 72% compared to on-demand. That's huge! Exactly, and that's why you should be aware of it. So you take advantage of them when the timing is right. And one last point about AWS pricing model is that some services like S3 offer tiered pricing, meaning the per unit cost decreases as your usage increases. Some AWS services offer a free trial or limited free usage. AWS Pricing Calculator allows you to estimate the monthly cost of any number of AWS services. AWS Pricing Model is pay-as-you-go, but you can get a considerable amount of discount when reserving resources. As you use more resources, the price per unit decreases. Now that you learned about AWS pricing, let me share with you three relevant services. AWS Billing, AWS Budget, and AWS Cost Explorer. Oh, that's confusing. They all seem similar. I understand, and that's why I will explain them together. They are, of course, all related to managing your spending with AWS, but each serves a different purpose. The billing service is what you use for paying your bills. You go to the billing section to set your payment method and to check previous statements. AWS budget, as its name suggests, is for budgeting purposes. You can set a cap on the budget you consider for a specific component. For example, you can set a budget of $50 monthly for S3, and as soon as your spending on S3 exceeds this preset amount, you will receive an alert. 
Cost Explorer allows you to analyze what you have spent on AWS services. It is a tool that enables you to understand and manage your AWS costs by visualizing them. Okay, it starts to make sense. Great, now that you got the overall idea, I can share more details about each service. First, a note about billing. When your organization grows, you likely create multiple accounts to keep things organized. But at the end of the day, they all belong to the same business. AWS Organization is a web service that allows you to consolidate all the billings and benefit from a bulk discount instead of paying them separately. And about AWS budgets, it is worth knowing that the information updates three times a day. And when your service cost gets close to the budget you set, you will get an alert. And finally, a tip about Cost Explorer. You can visualize, understand, and manage your AWS costs and usage over time with the Cost Explorer. For example, you can group your costs by service, region, or tag, and it provides an excellent insight into where your money goes. AWS Billing, Budget, and Cost Explorer are all services that allow you to understand and manage your expenses with AWS. With AWS Billing, you pay your bills. With AWS Budget, you prevent surprises and set limits on different costs. And with Cost Explorer, you visualize your expenses and analyze them. It especially becomes very handy when your business grows. What if I have a question, Chandler? How can I get the support I need? What if I get a stock? Oh, AWS provides you with the support you need. Some help is available for free, and you have to pay for some more responsive and detailed support. Can you tell me more about the differences? Sure, there are four types of support plans. Basic, Developer, Business, and enterprise. The basic plan means all the documentation and white papers that are available for free 24-7. It also includes the trusted advisor service and support forum. But if you want to send a question and get a response from someone in AWS, you need to use one of the three paid services, meaning developer, business, or enterprise. Exactly, and the main difference between them is the amount of support you need per month and how quickly you expect a response. For example, with the developer plan, you can send your case through email and for general guidance, you hear back within 24 hours. Whereas with the enterprise plan, you have 24-7 phone access and for mission critical system issues, you can expect a response in less than 15 minutes and I think it costs much more. Certainly, I think you can start with a developer support plan and as your business expands and depending on your needs, upgrade to a business plan. AWS offers some free support material, but to open a ticket and get a response from a technician, you need to buy one of the three paid support plans, developer, business, or enterprise. What is the best way of moving some of our existing services to the cloud? Do we need to build everything from scratch? Or could we use what we have but in AWS? First, you need to have an action plan. Migrating to the cloud is a process. For your business, since you are the owner, I think it is more straightforward. But in some larger organizations, finance, HR, tech, security, and IT teams all need to be involved. Right, for us, we know what we want to do. It is a matter of executing our plan. Well, when it comes to migrating to the cloud, you have six choices. Re-hosting, re-platforming, retiring, retaining, repurchasing, and refactoring. Rehosting is simple. It is also called lift and shift. You move your service as is. 
It is easy, but you may not get all the benefits of the cloud. Replatforming requires a bit more work. You lift, tinker, and shift. So no code changes. An example is migrating an existing MySQL to RDS. Retiring could be another solution to deal with some applications that are not needed anymore. Next is retaining. Some of your applications might be deprecated and ultimately retire soon. So you leave them as they are. Okay, now what does repurchasing mean? Well, you may consider abandoning your legacy software. For example, ending the license of an out-of-date database. And finally, refactoring requires writing new code and sometimes involves dramatic architecture changes. That was a comprehensive list. And what about data? We have some digital documents like scanned receipts that I want to move to S3. For a small amount of data, you can upload them via the internet. But for a massive amount of data, AWS offers a collection of physical devices that can help move data fast and securely. They are called the Snow family. Snow cone can move up to 8 terabytes. With 2 CPUs and 4 GB of memory, it has computing capability too. A Snowball Edge can move up to 80 terabytes and can run Lambda and EC2. And Snowmobile can store and move up to 10 petabytes. It is a truck that is accompanied by a dedicated security team and video surveillance. To migrate to the cloud, first you need to have all the relevant decision makers on board. Then you should have an action plan that could be composed of any of the six choices. Rehosting, replatforming, retiring, retaining, repurchasing, and refactoring. If your migration requires moving a massive amount of data, you should consider snow cone, snowball, or snowmobile, depending on the amount of data you want to move. Joey, have you thought of how to design the architecture of your solution? We are exchanging ideas with our dev and IT team. Do you have any recommendations? Well, not something specific about your business, but in general, there are five pillars for a well-architected framework that you can have in mind as you're working on the design of your system. And what are they? Operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. Some are self-explanatory, but tell me more about them. Operational excellence means how well you monitor your system and respond to events, making your changes reversible, anticipating failure, and frequently making small changes rather than big bang releases are all part of this pillar. Security, I think, is self-explanatory. True, but what improves it? Any points you have to share? That's a good question. Automate security best practices when you can. Apply security at all layers and protect data in transit and at rest. And next is reliability, which requires recovery planning. For example, handling fluctuating workloads or a database interruption. To achieve reliability, you need to implement horizontal scaling to increase system availability and automatically recover from failure. Fourth, you should consider performance efficiency, which is the ability to use computing resources efficiently. A good example is employing serverless computing services. And finally, cost optimization, which is managing the cost. Your goal should be to achieve the same level of security, reliability, and performance at the lowest possible cost. Managed services like RDS, for example, can reduce your overall expense. A well-architected framework addresses five characteristics. Operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization.